going to facilitate a conversation amongst all of you and Todd and Steve. So please um, uh, be uh, very interactive with what you'll be hearing from us this morning. Uh, as Michael said, uh, our session this morning is looking into the future, how to maintain a large portfolio of assets. And so as many of us have lived in this multi-unit environment for many years, we understand that it's not only the new facilities that we put into service, but those that we have and are existing and will need to refresh. So with me today, and as part of the panel, and the two people who will really share their knowledge with you this morning, is Todd and Steve. And I'm gonna let Todd and Steve kind of introduce themselves, give you a little bit of their background, and then start the conversation. I do have a number of thought-provoking questions that I have in my book, but hopefully all of you will also think of things to ask both Todd and Steve about their experiences and what they see in the future. So with that, I'll first introduce Todd. Well, good morning. Um, obviously, thank you all for being here, and, and you probably were on the nine o'clock bus last night. I got home because I don't think the 10 o'clock bus has showed up yet. <laughs> 10 o'clock bus. I was on the 10 o'clock bus too. What a great event last night, it was a lot of fun. Um, my name is Todd Taylor. I'm Vice President of Design for Darden Restaurants. Um, you met Suk Sing last night, who also used to work at Darden Restaurants and mentioned that there's quite a few brands. Absolutely correct. So we have currently seven brands that we operate. You, better, you know us better as Olive Garden, um, Longhorn Steakhouse, as the casual brands. In more of the specialty line, we start with Capital Grill, um, Seasons 52, Yard House, Eddie V's is a recent acquisition, and Bahama Breeze. So seven very, very different brands, um, and I'm fortunate enough to be oversee and work with a variety of very, very talented people that kind of help keep moving those brands forward. Um, prior to, to joining Darden, which was about eight and a half years ago, um, I had a very sorted past of a lot of different things from retail consultancy to working at the Limited up in Columbus to venturing down and working with Walt Disney Imagineering for seven years in their retail division and then a couple of few years um, in the hospitality side. So I've kind of played a little bit in a lot of your sandboxes um, in my career, but it's been a great experience and I've learned a lot along the way, primarily that there's a consistent thread that kind of ties all those various businesses together. So hopefully today when we talk a little bit about refresh cycles and things that go on in your businesses as well as our three businesses, um, we can share some of those ideas and thoughts and concerns. So that's a little bit about me. Great. Thanks, Todd. Good morning. I'm Steve LaMontagne. And before I introduce myself, I actually want to introduce our facilitator, John Mialogos, because uh, uh, John has been around this industry in retail for his whole career. So spending close to 30 years with McDonald's as their head of design and construction, also was with WD Partners for I think about seven years as their EVP of architecture and engineering. So um, he's now the, the senior director for store development uh, at Walgreens. So we're very fortunate to have John on our team to help us with our challenges and opportunities. So um, thank you. And a very shy person, by the way. So sorry about that. <laughs> so um, again, I'm Steve LaMontagne. So I'm the DVP for uh, design development and construction for Walgreens and uh, fairly new to Walgreens. I did a stint uh, consulting for them about two years back and uh, left and was lured back into the business. When I left, I spent, uh, believe it or not, I actually worked for Amazon. Lee, behave yourself. Don't ask me the tyrant question. Um, I'll cry. Uh, <laughs> um, and prior to that, about, uh, about 30 years within the food retail uh, industry for Ahold USA, uh, Super Value, Albertsons, where I led uh, design, development, construction, facilities, merchandising, services, um, new format development, and new business development um, in s some capacity at some of those companies. So quite frankly, after 34 years, you lose track of the timeline. Um, so happy to be here and uh, share some of the new challenges that we have at Walgreens. And uh, as Todd mentioned and, and John mentioned, we really want to hear from all of you. We want for this to be as interactive as it can, so please uh, uh, don't have this just be us talking to you about what's happening at Darden and at Walgreens, but we'd love to hear from all of you as well. 
So let's ask a real quick question. How many of you have ever heard of the seven second rule? No one knows the seven second rule? Come on, it's like, it's, it's seven seconds. In seven seconds they say that you're gonna make a decision based upon somebody that you may know or, your, or the impression that you make on, on various things. If you walk by a retail location in the mall, you got seven seconds to get from one side to the other side. You've got that little bit of time to make a determination, do I wanna go in or not? If you meet somebody in the streets, you're gonna make, make an impression, they're gonna make an impression on you that you're gonna determine if it's something that you like them, you don't like them. Impulse, it's important, and it's a very important thing for us. So think about things in your life and your businesses that um, will affect what you're doing. Um, so that seven seconds is a really critical thing to think about. So, uh, Todd, why don't we just continue on with that kind of uh, conversation. I know that we've talked about the differences between uh, asset refreshing um, in the different categories. So food and beverage, hospitality, retail. How do you think that there are differences or similarities within those categories and taking care of your assets? Well, I think the, probably the most similar thing amongst all those is the problem if you wait too long. Um, and that comes, and all of you, I see some laughing faces. Jody's over there cracking up. Um, we all have brands that are very old. Um, I've got some that are 35 plus years. Um, and some of you have, have worked for companies that have seen brands that are old. Um, if you wait too long, you may not be able to recover. Um, and in fact, they say that sometimes if you, if you get on that slope and it heads down, 10% of companies that actually um, fall into that pitfall never recover. Um, so they either get acquired or they close their doors or something to that effect. So is there a commonality between all businesses? Yes, absolutely. Um, but most importantly, if you don't do something, you could fail. And it's much harder to come back um, if you've kind of reached that slippery slope and you've started to fall down. At Olive Garden, for example, um, 12 years, same restaurant sales growth. Always moving this way. All of a sudden, and no one wanted to touch it. President of the brand said, don't even go that way. I don't want to be the one that's gonna make this wonderful restaurant plateau and go down. So no one, and everybody's afraid. So the old, the old uh, adage, if it's not broken, don't touch it, don't break it. That was their mindset. The problem is you got to the end of that period of time and all of a sudden recession hit, things slowed down a little bit. They hadn't prepared for the future. So what do you do? You've got to figure out how to react. You've got to react in, in a way that allows you to really reconnect with your guest. Because perhaps what you've done is you've lost that relationship because your guest of old is now not necessarily your guest of tomorrow or today. Um, so you really have to start thinking in terms. So, Brands like that, fortunately, have been able to recover. Thank goodness, so I still have a job. Um, but it's important to be thinking about getting ahead of the curve. Um, I equated to um, really a three, a five, and a 10 year plan. Three years, you better, start be, you better be thinking hard about what you're gonna do. And frankly, in a portfolio of restaurants of 850 Olive Gardens, they're not all gonna be the same. You can't cycle through them all and do those things, so therefore, what I'm saying is that you're gonna be remodeling or refreshing um, every so often and moving it forward so all of my 850 restaurants are not gonna be the same. You can't do that unless you've got an awful lot of money um, in the bank that you can put towards those because it costs a lot of money to really put forth the new, new idea or the fresh face. It's a challenge that you're gonna face. Steve? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think along the same lines, I mean, Part of it is about scale as well, right? Uh, the cycle at, for growth, for new store growth. Um, so you mentioned 800 stores for Olive Garden. Um, you know, at one point, uh, Walgreens was building 1,000 stores a year. Every 18 hours, they were opening a new store. And of course, everybody's on that, that train, right? And we're opening new stores and you're banging them out. And suddenly you wake up in the morning and you look back over your shoulder and go, oh my gosh, you know, I've got a fleet that's, you know, at average age 13 and a half years. Where do you go with that? Because then you, you then have that challenge because there's new innovation. We heard a lot of that from Lee and from others yesterday. And now you suddenly have to have the, that discussion with the C-suite executives about where do you really put your capital, right? How much do you invest in innovation versus refreshing those assets? And uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting challenge, 
when you start to think about uh, getting people excited around replacing parking lots, right? You know, it's really hard to have the discussion and go, hey, we've got to do a quarter of a million dollars worth of parking lot replacements. You know, hoo hoo, you know, let's, let's throw a comp store sales number at that hmm. thing, right? Um, it's hard to get people excited around that. So I think that balance in terms of how you invest in what I would call EBIT accretive kind of uh, initiatives um, and, and also the base. Uh, but, but, you know, interestingly, I think um, there is a lift associated once, once that, uh, as you mentioned, the guest suddenly don't want to show up, right? They notice the carpet's dirty or, um, you know, worn at the entrance. Um, so you, you suddenly then have to, there, there, is, there is a lift that can be associated once you get over that sort of hump, uh, if you will, where uh, just having a, the perception of a clean store, of an updated and a refreshed store. But I think the, the, the key is, is that you need to do it the right, not just in that right time, but the right scale. Um, as you talk about the scale of, of size of, of a portfolio, also think about the scale of the work that you're gonna do. I will give you an example of a problem that we found, fortunately we didn't go down that path, but it was one that we started which was what was defined as leveraging facility spending. Um, every restaurant or every retail um, has a facilities budget, things that you're constantly doing, updating kitchens or updating carpet, replacing um, elements here, just to keep them looking nice. Um, but what we tried at one point in time in the history of, of one of our brands was, let's take the items, let's break them into a number of smaller little pieces so that in a period of say five years, I'm going to replace all of these 10 things, let's say. Maybe carpet, lighting, whatever. Problem is, is if you, and the, the thought was, let's do it on the cycle when it wears out. So I wear out carpets every three years in a restaurant. Um, so every three years I'm replacing those. My window treatments are blinds every five years. My decor gets refreshed every so many years. Lighting, so on and so forth. So the thought was, let's just kind of do those in the cycle. The problem is, is that it takes five years to make one restaurant look good. Um, so all of a sudden, you haven't done it yourself any justice. What you've done is you've created this expectation that's so long that people don't really get excited about it. Because you need to get your guests excited about coming into your retail location or your restaurant. Um, that's a key piece for us. So we had to consolidate it and look at it from that perspective. We ran for 10 consecutive weeks, we made one change in the restaurant. Boy, it didn't link, it just really ran it out long and it really showed us that it wasn't something that we could wait to do. So we had to pull it back in tighter and figure out what made the most sense. Didn't go down that path, but you learn from some of those experiments that you kind of go through to figure out what's gonna work for you as a brand. It really is that fine line between um, what I would call business as usual maintenance capital, right? So, you know, the ceiling, you know, the, the roof leaks, you, re you, you place, replace a few ceiling tiles but at a certain time, you know, in retail, you want to, you want to do a wholesale change, right? So when do you, you do a major capital investment to say, hey, we want the stores to look clean, bright, right? So whether it's relamping, whether it's making sure the ceilings are white, um, you know, in our, we replaced uh, 1.8 million dollars, uh, 1.8 million square feet of ceilings last year. Like, who cares, right? But the customer does care in terms of the whole brand um, image as you move forward, but to, dot, to Todd's point, to do that um, as a single item, yes, it's important, yes, it's expensive, it's a lot of work, but when do you really start to get credit with the guests for the cumulative effect of the different things that you touch and what are the right things to be touching at the right time, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't quite recall the, the, the threshold limit, but that's exactly the effect that I'm talking about, right? So are there two of those 10 things, or is it five of those 10 things where the customer starts to recognize that, yeah, they've done something to the store, it's clean, it's refreshed, and therefore I'm gonna, I'm gonna shop more often, and suddenly, suddenly you're, you're starting to get that payback for the investment. It's really interesting at Walgreens, when I walked in about 200 days ago, and the CFO said to me, believe it or not, of all of the initiatives we're doing, we're actually getting the, the best lift out of refreshing our stores. I said, you've gotta be kidding me. You know, are, are you serious? What, you know, we gotta put in new beauty departments, right? And, and all of those things are, are important, but what happens is, is, is in, in our case, you know, the business has gotten to the point where 
the, the brand is not consistent, right? The store condition is not consistent. So you're starting to see some pressures on the overall organization. So um, it's really interesting now when we go to the board and say, you know, we need a quarter of a billion dollars to spend on things that quite frankly are not e EBIT accretive, but are just getting the business to be solid, to really, really make sure that that, that store base that you have is, is solid and consistent for, uh, for the customer. Yeah, and, and it's putting the dollars where they need to be placed. Mm -hmm. um, you can't just, and not every investment level is gonna be the same per restaurant or per retail location. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have various ones. Um, you may have a, a high, medium, and low scale on it based upon the location, based upon their sales, based upon the number of guests that they have that goes through, or you may have one center zone with a lot of different options that are out there that you can apply. And you gotta figure out what's gonna make the most impact for you for that guest. Is putting a new sign on the front of the building gonna draw them in? Is putting a tower on the building gonna make a change? Is color, changing the color of paint on the outside of the building gonna address them and, and, and bring them in? When McDonald's changed from the arches to the swoosh, <laughs> did that cause enough of, a, of commotion out there that everybody said, gotta go? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it shows something that's new and it's different that brings them in. We had a really interesting conversation with the gentleman. When I renovate restaurants, we don't ever close them down. Um, we just, we do it all in the evening and it may take six, eight weeks to go through that process, but we don't like to close a restaurant down. Um, and every, we had a, a guest that came that was sitting at the bar one night and said, I, mean, I saw him there and we, were, we started a conversation and he was just, he was an older gentleman about 65 years old and he was just full of life and energy and I just started this conversation and said, so what are you thinking about the remodel, the refresh that we're doing? And he said, he says, oh, I'm so excited, I can't wait till next week. I said, really? He goes, I come here every single week and I like to see the changes from week to week that I get to experience. This is my restaurant. And so he took ownership in it, and he was so excited about it. And I said, what do you like or don't like? And he goes, because I was afraid that we're moving the needle too far for somebody who's 65, which is a little bit older, guess than what I typically would be looking for to, to refresh a, a brand and move it from the traditional manner to where it, it was trying to go. He said, no, I'm excited. It makes me feel young. I said, great. You know, so you get great feedback from a lot of guests when you ask them questions but it's all about where you put those dollars in what you're doing. So the touch points, may it be the countertop, may it be the lighting fixtures, may it be some of the things that, that, that are just around the environment trigger that excitement, but it's, it's placing those dollars in the right location and triggering enough to bring them in to make that change is really critical. How are you guys all thinking about this? I mean, does anybody else want to share similar challenges? I wish I could have something to last that long. John, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, it is, it's an, it's an interesting concept. And in many cases, I will tell you that, and yet we have not yet talked about the aspect of how to fund and how to structure uh, refreshing, both in a concept that is company owned as well as franchisee, as well as now landlord contributions. And you have to look at all three. Uh, because all three can contribute to that type of cycle in, in understanding life cycle costs of the elements that, um, that you have in your facility. Uh, historically, yes, there have been many instances um, at McDonald's that we would tie refresh cycles to either franchise renewals, 
landlord re a lease renewals and obligate those parties to some contribution to the and, and more likely to the infrastructure uh, upgrades necessary during that time period. So it is, it is a wonderful way to think about it. Um, we had tied the understanding of what, um, once we put an element into service, what that life cycle of that element was, HVAC, flooring, lighting, and then tied, hopefully coordinated the renewal of that life cycle to that element. For example, with your carpet, if you've got a 10 year life cycle, doing a, a three year carpet would be, you know, you're gonna get stuck at that year nine. Do I, do I live with this carpet for an extra year or, or do I put in the carpet with anticipation I might have to walk away with two years right. of life left on that? Well, I, I think it's a little bit of strategy, but it's also the fact that, you know, the, it's most of, if a carpet needs refreshing or changing out in year nine of your 10-year ten, ten cycle, but it is really a bad carpet if it carries the odors, and restaurants are tough, because I get food particles, I get all kinds of stuff that gets embedded in them, and the worst thing about a restaurant is when you walk in the door, and it, if it stinks, you're walking, you're turning around and walking out. So I cannot afford to not replace in year nine um, could I stretch it? Yes. We tried um, carpet tiles as an example um, in our restaurants and everybody thought if we put carpet tiles in restaurants I could in the dry aisles replace them every three years keeping on that cycle. Maybe underneath the booths or under the tables I'm going to get four years, four and a half years. So we could play and with carpet tiles you can play that game. The problem is, is that carpet tiles don't always work as well. And that theory was great as a theory, but it didn't always pan out because you can't just do things in segments. Um, and unfortunately, with carpet tiles, water odors wick underneath the carpet and they stay there and they become very odiferous. Um, and nothing worse than a, a seafood restaurant that all of a sudden has that smell of seafood in the, in the, the restaurant. What a nice thing to be talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you I think, in, in, at least in our world, um, from a restaurant standpoint, love to stay on cycles, but it's, always, it's not always as easy as that. See, I, th I, think, um, I think you're spot on um, in terms of trying to line it up for those, what I would call, landlord negotiations, right? When you're, um, hey, we're going to walk, right? We want a shorter term. We want to renegotiate our rates, right? It's a different economy. Um, part of it is knowing what you have as well, right? So, um, unfortunately, in the Walgreens example, we haven't really known store condition for all of those key items um, for the entire state. Quite frankly, it just fell off the radar. And uh, you know, you'd start to get various feedback from the regional VPs of operations, or, but there's differences of opinion. So we're actually surveying between last year and this year um, every single one of our locations. We're putting boots on the ground, people have been trained to truly do a, a, a full asset survey, looking at key points, JLL's helping us with that as well. And, um, taking that feedback and getting out in front of those lease negotiation cycles to start to have the discussions with certain landlords around, hey, um, as part of this discussion, it's not just a, a rent discussion and, and a term discussion, it's a discussion around maybe you're gonna make a 50% contribution to the parking lot replacement, or we need exterior painting, or we want uh, landscaping upgraded, or we want the rest of a shopping center to be upgraded to match our store, for instance. Chris? John, John, I know you're, you've got a um, Euro background, but we do a lot of work overseas. We do a lot of work in Canada. In, in those markets, they have always had a very long-term kind of uh, CapEx contribution in terms of, of really understanding their existing asset base. In the United States, as retailers, we build buildings to throw them away in 5, 10, 15 years. And the investment capital that corporations put forth towards understanding what they currently have so that they can manage refresh programs has never been well funded. In today's world, when we're not building as many new and we're really concerned about retrofitting existing, what kind of capital strategies have you seen in your organizations to make an investment in really maintaining an accurate 
as-built set or accurate information from all those different snowflake locations that you have out there. So what kind of capital commitment are the corporations making to actually fund maintaining a viable database so that you can then refresh? Good, great question, Chris, uh, and thank you uh, for asking that. I'm gonna start out with Steve first on that question, only because I know that we've just recently gone through that exact type of discussion, then we'll go into Todd. Um, I think it's a great question, Chris. Um, I, I think um, it's really interesting. We started to, you know, I'd start to get emails from our president or from uh, folks that were on the ground and they would be, we have a new leadership team in place with the Wal Walgreens Boots uh, acquisition, right? So as those folks are out there actually getting what I would call boots on the ground, getting into the different markets and seeing the stores, it was really interesting. We started to get nuggets back on, well, why is this store like this? And why is that store so bad? And why hasn't this store made the capital investment cycle, right? Um, two reasons. One, I don't think we've done a great job historically of how we've actually decided what stores to invest in. It tended to be who screamed the loudest, right? And um, not necessarily thinking about the, the, overall, the overall store base. Um, two was the investment level on the maintenance and the repair side was very, very inconsistent as well. So I actually leveraged their ask because they were stepping right into it, actually coming back and going, why are we seeing these inconsistencies? And this is the way our customer is actually looking at it through the lens as well. And um, so we, I mean, the survey base, we, we've, we're, we've spent about $5 million literally just getting the survey work back and full commitment from our executive team um, to say that that database is absolutely crucial in terms of how we select stores and the items in that, that we touch. Todd? Wow. I think a lot of ours is um, the facilities department and maintenance departments within our organizations and each brand um, has a group of facilities directors as well as boots on the ground um, managers that are out there and they're, they're surveying those restaurants. Every year they go through a survey exercise and they determine what needs to be done from a, from a maintenance perspective but they're also telling us when things are wearing out um, primarily so it's not just equipment um, that may be going bad. It's looking at the carpets. It's looking at those cycles and trying to figure out the various touch and feel points of what needs to be done. It could be your bar tops are in really bad shape. We need to fix them. Um, so because we want to keep our guests happy. We want that experience to be positive. So every year they're going through that exercise and evaluating. They put all those requests into a bucket that gets determined what they can spend. Um, and then they are um, empowered to go out and make those changes. When you talk about a refresh program that you're going to lever on top, leverage on top of that, um, you look at those for various cases as well. So you take the surveys that you've done um, and you try to figure out how do you blend those together that you can get the most for the dollars that you have available. Um, but we leverage um, from that investment standpoint, you say, well, how much does a company want to put into it? Um, they'll put into it what they need to do that they know they can get the return on that investment. It's all about same restaurant sales growth. It's all about guest count increasing. So if we can um, increase my guest count by 20, 30 guests, um, then obviously that equates to dollars. And those dollars are something that help us down the road make a determination. Is it a $100 investment? Is it $100,000? Is it a $500,000 investment in that restaurant that I need to put forth? Married up with those facilities dollars that we have already in place to allow ourselves to do the things that are necessary. And uh, Chris, I'll uh, just add a little bit more context to this. I recently had some conversation with some old colleagues of mine uh, from McDonald's. Um, you mentioned also a global perspective on this. Uh, right now, 100% of the Australian market has been re-imaged. 95% of the European uh, restaurants have been re-imaged. And only 56% of the US uh, the follow-up question to that would be, if all those assets, and assets have been touched and surveyed, do we now maintain an existing database of information so that we don't have to go back and resurvey all those assets again? And I think that's the, that's the challenge that we see, because right now I think we're in kind of a, a crossing point in that corporations are realizing that they're going to have to make their existing assets work a lot harder. <laughs> And, you know, they typically do not want to spend the capex to, to maintain or to build 
so that you can then reuse it again in the future. And I think that's a very kind of a short-sighted U.S. mindset about retail. It has to change. That's correct. But I don't see corporations making that shift yet, but I think the pain points are starting to become significant enough that we're starting to see some fringe, fringes around that. So that's I, th I think you're right, Chris. I mean, I think we, um, we can't get into this position again, right? So, um, you know, with a, with a store base of over 8,000 stores, we can't get to the place where we're looking in, at, at each other in a room and kind of going, we actually really don't know what we have out there. So the $5 million investment is sort of the, the table stakes in terms of where you start. What we've been doing is we've been tracking for the last 14 months or so, any of those investments. So we've got 13 key categories that we touch. Um, as part of a store refresh program, much uh, more rigorous database in terms of what we're doing in terms of scope for remodel. And actually we've started to build, just in, I've started to see the results just in the last 90 days, actually started to create a predict, predictive model exactly. that starts to tell us when we're gonna start to see mm -hmm. these, you know, whether it's bar tops or carpet or carpet entrance mats, and, and, um, and, um, which is really, really interesting because now I can then start to project out what that capital investment program exactly. looks like for the long range plan. Right? Right. And exactly. So we look at the Vegas market, for instance, where um, you know, the traffic is fourfold what you'd get in, a, in a, a suburban corners format for Walgreens. And we actually have to think about the materials that we put in. So for instance, rather than doing laminate countertops, we're doing solid surface countertops. We're thinking about the bumper protection <coughs> at the checkout areas. But we're also actually, this is apropos, John and I were just having this discussion. Um, this week about two markets, New York and Vegas. And um, so when we start to talk about brand consistency, how we treat each of those assets in those markets is very, very different. So that predictive modeling is really giving us insight out to, to, into the 2018, 2019 long range plan. So it, it's making uh, for much more rigorous conversations with our CFO. Thank you. Todd, any uh, follow up to that? No, I think that, I mean, surveying is, at least in, in the restaurant world, because all seven of my brands act differently. Um, some of the things that I deal with and I have to address at Olive Garden are very different than what I deal with at Capital Grill. Um, foot traffic, very, very different um, in each of those particular brands. But they still have to go through the life cycle change outs and fixing up and refreshing and doing those various things. But we survey um, on an annual basis, you know, allow those facilities managers to get out there and really tell us what they need and what, they, what, what they're finding. Because that, as opposed to a retail location where you may go into it and, and you're shopping for something and you're gonna be in and out in probably 15, 20, 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. You're gonna be in a restaurant for hours, at least a casual dining restaurant or a fine dining experience. If it's casual, it may be an hour. If it's a fine dining, it may be two and a half, three hours. So there's so many things for people to see and focus on that you've gotta keep them fresh and you've gotta keep them um, yeah, they have to be guest ready at all points in time um, in making sure that we're doing the right things. The other thing I would, I would ask the team to think about too is when you think about how you survey the assets as well, and because um, you mentioned the facilities asset uh, managers, is that what you call them? And uh, same for us, we call them FAMs. And uh, you know, they're regionally located, all good folks, right? And they're maintaining an expense line P&L in terms of how they invest in their stores. So what we found, and I was not there, quite frankly, when I walked in the door, I wanted for our own people to be surveying stores. And uh, my team actually convinced me to actually do this using third party, right? It allowed for us, uh, right? They were very agnostic in terms of how they would approach the stores. We would train them so everyone's looking at it through the same lens. What we were finding was our regional facilities asset managers, it's pretty easy to check the box and go, sure, we'll spend Steve's capital money. I want my whole region in good shape so I can then drive down my expense lines. So it's something that you need to be thinking about. Um, again, all good folks, right? All with the best of intentions, but we have to be very, very agnostic and in, 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 in metric driven in terms of how we collect the data and how we, we sort of invest in those stores. Any other questions from the audience? Yes? Tom, 
Todd uses a cocktail napkin and I use a prescription bag. No. Um, <laughs> I'll let you start. <laughs> I can't come back on that. <laughs> Uh, you know, they behave it. themselves. <laughs> We've got 10 minutes left. Please behave yourself. Okay. Oh. <laughs> um, obviously, there's, there's a database that's collected of all that information that does come in. And, and that allows the facilities directors to sit down with the operating teams and simply say, these are the expenses that we foresee. Um, and they're going to make a decision. Do they want to put roofs on the buildings this year? Can I get by another year? Can I get that, meet my my lease term, so therefore I can get a little contribution. All those things come into play um, on, in that list, and there's a lot of back and forth debates and conversations that determine what that actually is. Um, but it does come back to corporate. They sit down, they go through it, they make those determinations, and it's not just the people that are in operations and the people in the field have a say in it. It is their facility, their restaurant, and they are given the keys to that restaurant to maintain it, and they have to maintain it, and if they don't, then obviously, Things are, they're looked upon differently. Um, they're, not, they're not graded as well or, or are bonused as well. So there's a lot of different things that come out of, of trying to keep your facilities up and, and current. I think, um, you know, the survey, the survey work is not whether it's, whether it's good or bad or broken or new, right? So there's gradation that happens in that. So part of it is the business has to determine what does good look like, if you will. And where, and where do you draw the line? And it may be different for different things. It may be very different for a carpet uh, or entrance mat in our store, for instance, um, very different than how you think about ceiling tiles or um, pharmacy counter replacements. So um, as you move all of this into a database, you're then running literally various scenarios to try to play with, hey, if we think we're gonna be somewhere about a quarter of a billion dollars, what does this thing start to look like? What are the most important things? So if, you know, in our instance, if, if, the, if the president wants all of the pharmacy, I'm making it up, wants all of the pharmacy waiting areas to be painted blue, regardless of when the store was built, sure. But we can actually tell you that. We can tell you where actually the pharmacy waiting areas need paint and where some of the newer stores, we're just gonna spend money because you want them to be blue. And is that really the best spend? Or do we wanna make sure that we've got floor tile replacement, right? in stores that are sitting 18, 19, 20 years old, where you may have a slip and fall, right? So we're, we're running those scenarios now. It's a, it's a work in progress for us, and it's very, very different because the lens has to be so wide, and you have to take it all in and run the different scenarios. And if you, if you make those changes, such as you recarpet, repaint, whatever, and if the, jo if the restaurant was recently just repainted, then I have to write that expense off. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I can't just do it because right. I want to, um, I have to deal with all those issues, so that comes down to the bottom line as well. Steve, why don't you uh, also address some of the work that we've been doing on the rebranding element and how we've kind of structured that across uh, Walgreens. I think that may uh, help answer that question also. Yeah. Um, I haven't done any work on the rebranding stuff. You've done it all, but um, I'm happy to speak to your efforts. The, uh, <laughs> There's that past facilitator. The facilitator. No, Remember the really title, facilitator. So we've had, um, it, it, it's interesting, within Walgreens, we've got about seven different branding packages out there, right? So some of the stores came in through acquisitions, whether it was Dwayne Reed's and they weren't, they weren't converted over, or they had different packages. We have some branding packages out there for the estate that go back to 1998. And um, so it was really interesting as we started to collect all this information and we actually surveyed, not through the asset survey, but actually through, through our stores, uh, gave them a bit of dummy proofs. We actually didn't know what branding packages we had in every store. Um, gave them sort of dummy proof pictures, right? So if your navigation sign looks like this, you have this branding package. If you have this, it sounds really basic. Um, it's, it's really a different thing when you're dealing with something that's so big, you know, so large that's out there. So what we've done is we've collected that data and uh, then determined the capital investment program and was able to have, for the first time, a discussion with our executive leadership this year to say, okay, we heard you. By the end of, two, of calendar 2016, the business will be out of every 1998 branding package, every 2008 branding package, every 2010 branding package, we'll get new navigation. So the consumer is looking at navigation consistently across all 8,000 stores by the end of 2017. So again, it's metric driven. It's how you put the things into the hopper and where you want to draw the line. Yeah. And 
Thank you. Hand you the microphone. At ANF, uh, our company is undergoing fleet reviews with our new presidents for Hollister and Abercrombie and Fitch, uh, alongside with actually our real estate department's heading these up. And so my question is, based on everything you've said, and also about capex spend, and um, in in all of your country or countries and U.S., uh, the, the, how how often do you look at the demographics, how each region is is uh, is operating, how competitors are uh, are proceeding and succeeding. Um, and because for us, this is one of the first times we've done a full review. We have obviously new brand presidents, and so they have different agendas, different ideas. But how often do you do a full-blown fleet review uh, to kind of to gauge your long-term planning? That's a question. Are you saying from a from a real estate portfolio? Yeah, real estate portfolio. How often do you guys kind of? Um, for Walgreens, historically. Um, just keep banging them out. I'll be quite honest with you. And it was a bit of a law of the averages. Some, some, would, some were positive and some were not so much. The new leadership team is really kind of focused on looking at the changing uh, demography uh, within certain markets. Quite frankly, you know, a store that was built 15 years ago in a certain suburb on a corner um, with the changing demographic around it is, may, has cha may have changed, right? So one, we need to look at the offer and the mix within the overall location in our instances, right? Some are more healthcare focused, some are more front end focused or convenience focused. Um, but, but, and through that lens, along with looking at the real estate lease options, start to make some decisions around portfolio rationalization, making some hard decisions. Um, you know, so we've, we, you know, we've, we've announced publicly we're closing 200 stores. People go, oh my gosh, Walgreens is closing stores. It's like nothing. Think about it, right? It's on a chain of 8,400 stores, it's smart business. And what, what you don't see is, is that we're also building 100 new stores. So a lot of those are, again, the customer has moved, right? We see different opportunities. Um, some of the urban sprawl moving into the, into the city centers, looking at things differently, different size formats as well. Um, but also looking at two-for-one options as well, right? So in our particular instance, we're overstored. And um, so part of that is just making some rationalization to say we're going to close these two, and the location is actually here. Todd, any follow-up? I think, I think what Steve said was, was right on the money. The demographics change. We tend to do it by lease cycles. So you look at if it's a 10-year lease with three, five-year options, you're going to figure out in that sequence when you have to have look at, at a location because it does change around you. If the mall used to be right in front of you and all of a sudden it died and moved down the street three blocks, you're kind of on an island by yourself. So you've got to figure out how does that work in the big, in the big picture and do I think about reinvesting down the road and moving that restaurant or that location down there or do I reinvest in it to try to bring them back? It was the 10 years that I've been there on the lease that, that as it made me a foothold in this community that everybody's gonna come here anyway. You have to evaluate all those options and, and the real estate team in our, in our company really looks at those various things. The asset management team, when they go through the lease, lease um, terms, they really are evaluating what makes the most sense. So I'll, uh, again, I'll just add a, um, uh, a quick comment to that. Um, what I would suggest to you is that you don't look at your location as the center of your marketplace, that you look at the marketplace first and understand uh, the demographics and all your drivers uh, within that marketplace and then make the decision, is it uh, a remodel? Does it, well, first of all, does it need to be there? Is it a remodel or a refresh situation? Is it a rebuild? Is it a relocation? There are many options in regards to moving that brick and mortar in the appropriate place in the market. But start with the market, because that's really uh, the driver of many of the brick and mortar decisions that we make in a multi-unit environment. One last one. Yeah. Uh, 53, yep, we've got one minute. Yep, <laughs> make it quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it's a much more complicated question than that. Um, Jody knows it because she's, she lived the nightmare with me when she was working with us at Darden. Um, it's easy to go forward. 
it's really hard to look in your rear view mirror and address all the other things that you have back, back there because the restaurants in our case were built 20, 30 years ago and the dimming systems are not compatible to those to LED lighting today. So you gotta change out that. So now I've got a 15 to $20,000 dimming panel I need to put in there in place to really drive the lights that are there. Plus the restaurant itself is not necessarily wired or circuited properly because over the years facilities said, I need a TV right there. So they pull off the strand that's there, the power that's there. Now that no longer can be dimmed because I can't dim a TV. So I got all kinds of issues that aren't working together. So you really have to do a full analysis, especially going backwards. As I said, going forward is easy. You put all the pieces in place. It is important, but the industry from a lighting standpoint is changing and there's a lot of lighting guys here um, at the conference, but um, lamps are harder and harder to come by than what they used to be. Everybody's moving to fixtures because fixtures is a long-term 10 year, investment that you can do and you can change out a component as time goes on. A lamp itself is a simple way of, of fixing something. So we can put a lamp up here or there. The problem is, is those big companies that used to make the lamps are now saying, well, wait a minute, as opposed to putting something that someone's going to replace three times a year, or whatever it happens to be, because they're going to get 2,500 hours out of it. Now they're getting 10,000 hours out of it or 50,000 hours out of it. They don't want to carry it because it, it's something that doesn't make sense for them. So they're not manufacturing the lamp, they're trying to push the fixtures. So when you've got a lot of assets and you gotta look in the rear view mirror, you gotta figure out what the right solution is. So it's a lot more complicated in a financial investment than what, than simply just saying, let's go in. It's the right thing to do. You just gotta figure out where do, where do you get the dollars and how does it come together? So um, uh, thank you, Todd. Thank you, Steve. We're a little bit over time.